Space Marine chapters are certainly the pride and jewel of mankind's armed forces. Yet, in the scale of warfare being waged in the grim future, they are dwarfed by the other units of the Astra Militarum. In fact, when put in proper context, the Astartes are of vanishingly small strength with no ability to truly act as the guardian angels for all mankind. Rather, this role of the everyman's defender falls to the humble ranks of the Imperial Guard. Theirs is a vast, galaxy-spanning institution whose chimeran shape and size is impossible to document. But today, we shall nonetheless make the attempt by exploring the shared characteristics of its organizational building block, the Imperial Guard Regiment. From the loadout of its individual soldiers, to their leaders, their various weapon squads, the unit hierarchy, and beyond. To aid us, we shall use as our model the finest soldiers of the Imperial Guard. This is the true size of the Cadian Shock Trooper Regiment. If you also want to deploy your own Imperial Guard forces, you can do so with today's sponsor, Tacticus, which brings the armies of Warhammer 40,000 to the accessible palm of your hand. They've been a long-time supporter of this series, and I stand behind my endorsement as someone who plays almost every day. Tacticus is a mobile game where you build squads to fight tactical battles, where abilities, positioning, line of sight, and elevation all matter. Level design, enemy types, and boss mechanics are all well thought out, and make for refreshing gameplay across the various modes, which includes theme campaigns, wave-based onslaughts, guild raids, guild wars, PvP arena fights, tournaments, and more. I really appreciate the constant updates to the game, which keep it fresh, balanced, and always leaving me wanting more. For instance, this month, the Gene Stealer Cult is being released as the newest faction. With both a high-ranking cultist and a patriarch, you'll be using stealth and manipulation to now win your battles. Also joining the fray will be Magnus the Red as a guild raid boss. What's even better is there's a ton of events and updates coming for October and beyond. Having myself unlocked most of the characters and completed all the campaigns, I can honestly report I've gotten a ton of fun out of Tacticus without having to spend a single dollar. So please consider supporting the channel by pausing the video now to give Tacticus a download by scanning the QR code above or clicking the link in the description below. And while you're at it, be sure to use the code INVICTAOCT for these awesome goodies. Enjoy! The Imperial Guard is a vast military organization of unfathomable complexity, the likes of which its own administrators fail to even grasp. However, some semblance of order is given by the existence of regiments, each raised from their own planet, which act as the primary organizational unit of the Imperial Guard. Yet, given this fact, regiments are also far from standardized owing to the diverse nature of their homeworlds. Their training, equipment, composition, and size varies widely. For instance, while one regiment may feature elite drop troopers numbering in the hundreds, another regiment may feature ill-trained conscript infantry numbering in the tens of thousands. The incarnations of such units are endless. But regardless of their flavor, it is a general practice across the Imperial Guard to raise such regiments within a strictly confined role to mitigate the dangers of individual units turning traitor, a brutal lesson learned from the Horus heresy. Thus, an infantry regiment in isolation will not contain much heavy armor, while conversely, an armored regiment will not contain much infantry. In theory, this may result in an overly restrictive combat doctrine. However, in practice, combined arms warfare is achieved by having multiple regiments working in tandem or exchanging support units. With this understanding in mind, let us now turn to Cadia of the 41st millennium, where the finest regiments of the Imperium are raised. The planet of Cadia lies to the galactic northwest of Terra. In many ways, 
it once held much in common with the birthplace of humanity, owing to its similar gravity, breathable air, moderate climate and diverse biomes. However, the major difference was the fact that Acadia lay on the precipice of the Eye of Terror, a massive warp rift through which raw chaos energy pours. Even more significant was the fact that Cadia existed along one of the few regions of stable space leading into or out of this breach of the material realm. Such a predicament would steer the fate of this world. In the early years when the planet was first colonized during the dark age of technology, such effects were minimal. However, following the age of strife, its isolated inhabitants would fall to the Dark Gods, eventually corrupting the Primarch Lorgar and his word-bearers upon the eve of the Horus heresy. For their role, they would be destroyed to preserve the secrets of this conspiracy. Yet, when the traitor legions were eventually defeated and chased into the Eye of Terror, it would be upon Cadia that a resurgent Imperium would post a guard over this dangerous portal. Over the following centuries, Numerous Black Crusades would issue forth from the Eye, testing the metal of Cadia and its defences. With each wave, the planet's resolve only grew stronger, eventually resulting in the evolution of one of the most heavily defended fortress worlds in the entire Imperium. As a consequence of this status, the planet of Cadia proved highly militarised. Everything from its infrastructure to its institutions, its culture and its people were fine-tuned for war. Training in the armed forces was mandatory for all citizens with over 70% of the population, including men and women, participating in active duty at any given point in time. This journey would begin early on as children were taught to strip rifles, maintain gear and obey strict orders. Teenagers, in turn, conducted regular field drills, survived brutal rites of passage, and were ultimately enrolled in youth armies known as the White Shields. Such formations helped mould them into soldiers through both training and combat alongside regular soldiers. In due time, White Shields could earn the right to ascend into the ranks of true regimental units. For many, this would mean an initiation into the planetary defense forces of the Interior Guard. For others, this would mean shipping out to join the Imperial Guard forces as Cadian Shock Troopers. After years of service, the most veteran among these sons and daughters of Cadia may even have the honor of joining the elite Kazakin units, so named after the fortress city Kazas of their homeworld. Once more, we should be reminded that Cadian regiments within each of these groups can take on a variety of forms. As an example, we can now review the high-level organization of two theoretical Cadian regiments which might find themselves deployed together. The first is a Cadian Line Infantry Regiment. Its regimental HQ is led by a colonel and supported by his staff in the command company. The main fighting force, meanwhile, consists of three infantry companies. Each is led by a captain and their command squad. Beneath them are four platoons. Each features their own lieutenant-led HQ and three ten-man squads led by a sergeant. Support for the company comes in the form of the following. An auxiliary force of three Ogryn squads to bolster the line a psycho force of nine weird veins to wield warp powers, a political officer force of 18 commissars to maintain morale, and a ministrorum force of 180 attendants to uphold the faith and assist in various duties. Its sister unit, the Armoured Regiment, is similarly led by a colonel and a command company which, in this case, will be housed in a Lehman Rust tank and a Chimera APC. Beneath them are three armoured companies, each composed of ten Lehman Rust tanks led by a captain, 
in addition to a fourth heavy company composed of a single mighty Bane blade. In support of the group will be a recon squadron of three sentinels and an air defense squadron of three hydras. But these are just two examples described from a high-level table of organization. Now let us pivot to take a closer look at what Akkadian Shock Trooper Regiment actually looks like from a ground's eye perspective. At the lowest level, a standard infantry squad consists of nine guardsmen led by one sergeant. They boast camouflaged uniforms, flak armor, and shoulder guards which bear the number of their squad. Helmets are typically of the Aquila pattern and can be equipped with rebreathers to withstand poison or gas attacks. For battlefield coordination, the squad's number two, typically a corporal, is often equipped with a Voxcaster for communication with their fellow squads and their HQ. Infantry weapon selection, meanwhile, can vary greatly based on the situation and has the advantage of being of superior quality owing to the excellent manufacturing facilities of Cadia. More often than not, though, the bulk of a squad will sport an M36 Cantrell pattern LAS rifle, a combat knife and frag grenades. A few members of the squad may be armed with specialist support weapons, such as flamers, plasma guns, and grenade launchers. Cadian sergeants, meanwhile, can often be seen sporting a LAS pistol and chainsaw. Additional utility items may also be worn to assist in their duties as squad leaders. Alongside the standard infantry squads come special weapon squads. Composed of five specialist guardsmen led by an NCO, often a seasoned corporal, these are skilled units meant to handle a variety of roles. For instance, recon might be tasked to a team featuring three pairs of snipers and spotters. Cadians, after all, are regarded as excellent marksmen, and such squads will make for ideal scouts and battlefield assassins. A different team, meanwhile, may act as combat engineers, boasting flamers, plasma guns, and demolition charges. Here, Cadian Resolve will see them storm even the mightiest enemy fortifications. Another foundational unit is the six-man Heavy Weapon Squad. It is composed of three two-man teams, with the senior-most man, often a corporal, acting as the overall lead. What distinguishes such Heavy Weapon Squads from their specialist counterparts is that they boast even more high-powered weapons at the cost of reduced mobility. The exact kit is tailored to the mission at hand. This might include anti-infantry weapons such as mortars, heavy bolters and auto cannons, or anti-armor weapons such as LAS cannons and missile launchers. And finally, we would be remiss not to mention the conscript squads. They are composed of the greenest troops, which are often hastily raised in emergency situations and lumped into groups of 20 to 50 soldiers. The general idea is that the sheer weight of their firepower will make up for their lack of experience. In most armies, they are the ultimate form of imperial cannon fodder. Among the Cadians, however, the conscript squads will often be composed of well-trained youths from the so-called White Shield armies. In comparison to the shock troops, they have much to learn, but compared to your average guardsmen, they fight as near peers. At the next level, several squads will be joined into a platoon, led by a lieutenant and their HQ. The number and composition of these squads will correspond to the overall role of the platoon. For instance, while a light infantry platoon may prefer its mobile infantry squads, a pioneer platoon will likely feature a greater ratio of special weapons, and an anti-tank platoon will feature more heavy weapons. For our model, we shall assume that this infantry platoon has four standard infantry squads, two special weapon squads, and two heavy weapon squads for a total of 64 combat troops. At the top of their chain of command is the platoon leader 
and their HQ. When deployed, this staff will often be assigned a Chimera APC. Not only does this grant them protection and mobility in the field, but it also hosts important equipment such as long-range Voxcasters for communication with High Command. The platoon leader will typically be a commissioned officer with the rank of a first or second lieutenant. Though such leaders may be quite junior in the overall army hierarchy, among Cadians, they are nonetheless highly experienced individuals who have passed through the rigorous halls of its finest military academies. Given the militarized nature of Cadian society, it should also be noted that such officers will often be drawn from its actively serving nobility. Thus, they can be expected to bear marks of distinction befitting their rank and prideful background. In some cases, this may even mean wielding custom sabers, power fists, and personal refractor fields. In their duties as platoon leaders, lieutenants are assisted by a small personal staff of NCOs. These will typically include a flag bearer, a vox operator, a medic, and additional technical experts or specialists. Attached to this group may be an additional member, the Commissar. Donning distinctive caps and great coats, they hail from the Officio Prefectus, which is an entirely separate military organization than that of the Imperial Guard. As such, these political officers technically exist outside of the chain of command, with a broad mandate to do all that is necessary to maintain the morale of the troops. Under normal circumstances, this will usually mean that commissars act as advisors to the HQ, willingly following the directives of their unit's leadership. However, when they deem that their directive clashes with such orders, commissars have sufficient authority to countermand them and even enact disciplinary measures up to and including the summary execution of officers. Thus, do they act with both incredible courage and brutality, which inspires the simultaneous awe and fear of the units to which they are attached. Zooming out, we can witness the already appreciable size of our 70-man strong platoon. On its own, such a force may hold a few hundred meters of a battle line and be able to take on a range of tactical objectives. Yet, we must go up another level to begin considering units with broader military capabilities. Next, several platoons will be joined into a company led by a captain and their HQ. Once more, the number and composition of its elements will depend on the role of the company. Infantry companies may be of the light, heavy, drop or mechanized variety, while armored companies deploy light, heavy or super heavy tanks, and artillery companies deploy regular, heavy or field battery units. Once more, our model will assume a moderately sized and balanced line infantry company. It is composed of five of our previously defined infantry platoons, which together total some 355 soldiers and officers. Added to them is a heavy weapons platoon, which provides additional support. It is composed of six heavy weapons squads split into pairs of mortar, anti-tank and fire support squads. This unit has its own platoon HQ led by a lieutenant and five NCOs with an APC for the transport of men and supplies. Together, this heavy weapons platoon is 42 men strong. The roughly 400 troops of these combat platoons will report to a company's HQ platoon. At this level, its commander is a commissioned officer who bears the rank of captain. Such leaders will be battle-hardened. Having experienced many years, if not decades, in the military, they bear both the scars and awards to show for it. But no matter the personal qualification, no company leader will be found without their trusted staff. This includes the typical assortment of NCOs we previously covered and a higher-ranking commissar. 
for enhanced support, there may also be priests attached from the Adeptus Ministrorum and perhaps a dozen medical staff featuring surgeons and orderlies. We shall assume that to account for all this added manpower, the HQ has been assigned the use of three chimeras, one of which may be converted for medical use. In addition, we will assume that a recon squadron of three sentinels has been attached for the sake of enhanced patrol and observation. Zooming out, we can appreciate the increasing combat strength of our company. With such numbers and hardware, it can flexibly adapt to a vast range of battlefield conditions, whether that means deploying in a wide, a deep, or a dispersed formation. Such capabilities will only further be enhanced as we now step up to the top of the organizational ladder. Next, multiple companies will join together to form a regiment led by a colonel and their associated HQ. Again, we recognize that there is no rule dictating the size or composition of this largest of Imperial units. For our model, we will assume that 10 of our prior companies make up this infantry regiment. These will be ranked in seniority from 1st to 10th. But the most novice units will actually be the squads of White Shields whose youth soldiers have been assigned to serve on rotation within this regiment. We shall assume that there are a total of 10 such squads, or about 300 troops, which shall be distributed across the 10 companies. Here they will complete their training through a baptism by fire in the battles of the Imperial Guard. At full strength, these combat units muster about 4,530 troops and attached personnel. But we must now consider the additional elements which round out the roster of the regiment. At the head of the organization will be the regiment's HQ company. It is helmed by a commissioned officer with at least the rank of colonel. Larger or more esteemed regiments may instead be led by a general or even a Lord Castellan. Whatever the case, they will be of impressive degree, especially for those leaders which have risen up through the fiercely competitive ranks of the Cadian armed forces. Besides them will be the members of their HQ staff. Within its inner circle will be a second in command who often bears the rank of major and a high ranking commissar. Besides them will be regimental advisors who might come from other organizations of the military or who may hail from important civilian institutions. Standing close by will be the chief standard bearer, honor guards, and other high-ranking commissioned officers or specialists. Beyond this inner group, one should expect to find a far more expansive administrative staff after all, such regiments are operationally independent units within the Imperial Guard, which must be equipped to deal with these complexities. A burden not shouldered by the HQ staff of a company or platoon. Among this wider group, we may count dozens of medical staff, priests, records keepers and menials. Outside of the infantry companies and the command company, we may yet consider further groups which have been bolted onto the regiment to grant it improved capabilities. One of these units will be the Militarum Auxilla. In our case, we shall assume this amounts to a handful of Ogryn squads. Such abhumans are prized for their great strength and unflinching loyalty. As such, they may be concentrated for use as shock troops, all dispersed across the regiment to stiffen the line or to act as bodyguards. Another addition will be about 10 psychers of the Scholastica Psychana, who shall be used to channel the energies of the warp to protect and embolden their allies or to attack and undermine their foes. And finally, we will add three squadrons of sentinels and 10 chimeras which have been assigned to the regiment. These will be used by the commander to improve mobility and logistics of his force. In combat, they may also be combined with infantry units to transform them into mechanized forces for a more powerful armored assault. 
Zooming out, we can now appreciate the awesome might of this Cadian Shock Trooper Regiment. Altogether, it boasts about 4,640 individuals, 100 chimeras, and 40 sentinels. Here is a table which documents our model's assumptions. Feel free to pause to review the fields. For added context, we can now dive into the data's analytics. In terms of overall role, 84% of the individuals belong to combat squads, 10% belong to officers of the HQ staff, and 6% belong to support staff such as the medical, priestly, or scribal personnel. Of those belonging to combat squads, we can break them out by role. There are 200 infantry squads, 100 special weapon squads, 160 heavy weapon squads, 10 conscript squads, and 5 miscellaneous squads. Accounting for squad size, this results in 51% belonging to infantry squads, 15% to special weapon squads, 25% to heavy weapon squads, 8% to conscript squads, and 1% to miscellaneous squads. Reviewing these numbers reveals how this particular regiment is balanced and what sort of combat effectiveness one might expect from it. At the same time, it also makes it clear that other regiments may very well have varying characteristics. All of this is data which must be considered by the higher-ups of the Imperial Guard. But for now, we hope this rudimentary understanding of a theoretical Cadian regiment has proved useful in grasping the scope and scale of the Warhammer 40,000 universe. What topics should we cover next? A big thanks to our fans on Patreon and YouTube memberships for supporting the channel and to the researchers, writers and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you liked this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.